So I'm finally here, getting started in earnest on Season 2 of Attack on Titan. I took a week to watch and review some OVAs, which some people liked, but the audience size was smaller. But now I'm digging into Season 2. I'm sorry I made you wait, but I didn't make you wait as long as Wit did, so let's get to it. If you watch the reaction videos, you might be happy to know I got my tooth fixed. See that? So I'm sorry if my snaggle tooth kind of grossed you out on those. But there are some really good points to get into with these two episodes, and I think I should probably start with Pastor Nick and the Wallace religion. So this priest, he insinuates that the clergy always knew there were titans in the walls. And maybe that's why they were so opposed to, like, any alterations in the walls whatsoever. And they were also opposed to those plans that would block the gates. But what I kind of want to know is, how does the clergy know this secret? Like, do they trace their roots back to when this happened? Are they somehow secretly related to the monarchy and the government? And why is the clergy helping to cover this up? Like, why doesn't the clergy want to share this with the followers of the religion and with the population as a whole? Like, I don't know why the clergy wants to participate in this cover-up, why they want to keep this a secret. But... Despite being unlikable, Nick doesn't come across as a charlatan. That's Pastor Nick, the priest. He does seem genuinely pious and to genuinely believe in his faith. And we see this because when Hanji's threatening to drop him off the wall, he just spreads his arms out wide and he says something like, the Lord is my shepherd or something to that effect. And he seems absolutely willing to die for his Wallace beliefs. Even though the public-facing doctrine of his religion seems a little false or misleading. And at one point, Haji makes a statement to the effect that he's dedicated to something more important than the fate of humanity. But it's hard for me to imagine, like, what might be more important than the fate of all humanity in this Attack on Titan world? What kind of secret could be so important that it's worth every single last human being dying to keep this secret? I really struggle to even speculate on what that might be, unless there are maybe more humans somewhere else out there who are being protected by all this secrecy that's going on within the walls of humanity here in the central part of the show. Or maybe the pastor really is just some kind of kook and I'm giving him too much credit. Now, also here in episode 26, we see that the new cadets are being sequestered away from any population centers. And for some reason, they're dressed in street clothes. They're not allowed to wear their uniforms. I don't know what the reason for this is, but they notice that it's kind of strange that they're not allowed to wear their military uniforms. Now, when I think about it, one reason to keep them sequestered is probably because two members of their class, at least two members so far, Aaron and Annie, well, they've already been shown to be Titan shifters. So I suppose that there's not any reason there couldn't be another one or even more than another one in this class of cadets. And as I speculated at the end of season one, I really do think there's something significant about the age of these cadets in being Titan shifters. So I think that greatly increases the chances that there are going to be more shifters in this group of cadets. So keeping more potential Annies out in the middle of nowhere might be a really good security measure. And of course, Aaron, Armin, and Mikasa are not being sequestered because they are well-known quantities to Ervin at this point, so he doesn't really have any questions about them. He kind of knows both the good, the bad, the full measure of these three. But what other reasons might there be to keep these cadets sequestered, to keep them away from everyone else? Well, maybe it's to protect this newest group of military, these youngest troops, safe from any attacks that are targeting the military, and that's why they're in their street clothes and they're away from military places and population centers. Maybe Ervin wants to spare them for some reason? I don't know what that reason is. Perhaps that's why they're not in uniform. But also, with what I've seen from Ervin, it's not out of the question to use them as bait, to use them to draw out other Titan shifters, perhaps. And of course, we see that that does kind of happen in the course of episode 26. But another reason for the street close, it just might be that Ervin needs some people who can blend in with the populace at some stage in this intricate plan that he undoubtedly has already set in motion. And Mike, Mike is in charge of this sequestered unit. And I guess he's not just a creepy sniffer, but he may actually be a gifted sniffer because he's able to like 
sniff the wind, he can smell that the Titans are approaching before you can actually see them. Also, Sasha, she has her ear to a table and she's able to hear them approaching uh, before anybody else can too. So I wonder with Sasha if they're portraying this as a little bit of a supernatural hearing that she has or if it's just more like a typical portrayal of a wilderness survival trait that she's acquired by growing up in the woods, which we'll see more about that in the next episode. But what we do see without a doubt is that Titans are inside the area protected by Wall Rose. But I don't think it's ever said exactly where the breach is or how the Titans got into this territory. And my first assumption is that they're all Titan shifters and they didn't have to breach the wall. And there's good evidence that a couple of them are Titan shifters. But we do have a bunch of what seem to be more like run-of-the-mill Titans, if there is such a thing as a run-of-the-mill Titan. So... I'm guessing a Titan shifter must have like opened a gate or something or maybe moved one of the boulders out of the way in order to let just the regular old Titans in for some reason. And I don't know what this reason would be, but the scout cadets, and I guess I'm back to calling them scouts again instead of the survey corps. I'm kind of going back and forth on that, but they evacuate on horseback with instructions to spread word of the invasion to villagers and such. They kind of go in the four cardinal directions. And since Sasha and Connie grew up around these parts, they head in the directions of their respective homes. And then Mike breaks off from the troops as a whole, and he goes off to fight Titans. And when this happens, we're told that Mike's Titan fighting skills are second only to the legendary Captain Levi, something I didn't really appreciate before this. And Mike encounters what has to be the strangest Titan yet. It's this huge Sasquatch looking Titan. And I'm assuming this must be the Beast Titan that the title refers to. And not only does this Titan look different, but he can talk. And unlike the talking Titan in Ilsa's notebook in that original video animation, this one's fairly eloquent. I mean, he talks on human level, which is extra odd since he looks like an overgrown skunk ape. Now, if you didn't watch my review of Ilsa's notebook, and according to the numbers, a third of you probably didn't, you might want to go check it out, because I spend a little time speculating about Titan verbal abilities and why they may exist in the first place, and there's another connection to that OVA that'll come up later in this review. But I have no doubt that this beast Titan is a Titan shifter. After all, he mentions that Mike must have figured out, and this is a quote, we reside in the nape. And of course, the nape is where we've seen Aaron and Annie to be when they're removed from their Titan form. And now I really start to suspect that maybe there's like a human-sized Sasquatch guy that's roaming around in the woods out there because Annie and Aaron both kind of resemble themselves in Titan form. So I think this guy probably resembles this strange-looking Harry and the Hendersons Titan himself. I don't think that River Shoulders is any different than the humans when he goes from Titan form to, to human form or Sasquatch form. And you probably only get that River Shoulders reference if you're like a fan of the Dresden Files. And my next question is, if this mysterious beast boy is hiding out in the woods somewhere, is he a distinct species? Or is he a human who was experimented on and turned into this creature? I also kind of think it'd be sort of hilarious, like in a Saturday Night Live skit sort of thing, if Ervin narrows it down to five people who could possibly be the Beast Titan. And he brings in Armin to help him figure out which one of these people is the Beast Titan. Armin helped figure out who Annie was, so maybe he can figure out who the Beast Titan is. And there's like a police lineup with four normal looking people and one person who looks like Mighty Joe Young. And he brings in Armin and Armin just starts pulling his hair out because he says it's impossible to deduce which one of these is the Beast Titan. I don't have enough evidence. I'm sorry. And then eventually they like drag off some poor blonde haired lady who looks nothing like the Beast Titan and that's your punchline. But I do really like this idea that I kind of gave myself that maybe this beast man is a distinct species and maybe his species had the ability to become beast titans. And then the humans were battling them for land because that's something people do a lot. And that's why humans created titans so they could have their own titans to battle these native peoples. And I even like the idea that maybe the humans use blood from one of these indigenous beings to develop their own Titan serum, and that it's an imperfect copy, and that's why the Beast Titan seems so much more in control of his Titan form than any of the other Titans we've seen. But I also like the idea that some unforeseen Titan serum complication just turned one poor kid into a Beast Man. So I guess what I'm saying is, 
no matter what direction they go with it, I think I'll be satisfied. And aside from looking like a lowland yeti, there's another hint that this creature isn't familiar with human society, because he seems intrigued by Mike's mobility gear, something it seems like most humans in this civilization are familiar with. The Beast Titan even takes the engine from Mike's gear with him as he walks away. And the lesser titans, they seem to obey this beast titan's commands. Because once he gives them their leave, they kill poor Mike, who I was starting to think might actually survive this encounter and go on to tell other people about the beast titan. But I guess that's not going to happen. Now my assumption is that this beast guy is going to study this mobility gear. But I hope he doesn't reverse engineer it for titan use, like upscale it. Can you imagine how horrific it would be to see titans zip around with mobility gear? The title of episode 27 is I'm Home, and as the story unfolds, it will apply primarily to Sasha, but it also brushes up against Connie near the end. But I suspect that like the next episode is really going to be Connie's, episode 28. But I wonder, is there more than one meaning behind this title of I'm Home? Is being home something Sasha's never quite been before? Because it starts to feel like that as you watch this episode. We see her in a flashback, living in the wilderness as like this rugged frontier individualist. But she's wanting to hang on to a way of life that doesn't quite exist since Walbaria fell. And her father seems to kind of be like a counterpoint of reason in these interactions that she has with her father. When she's talking about wanting to hold on to the old ways of life. And despite being an individualist... He actually seems to be a little bit of a humanist, and he says some things that to me make sense. Sasha's father doesn't want to cast aspersions at the refugees, who are the ones that are triggering this chain reaction that's, in effect, encroaching on his land and his daughter's way of life and his own way of life. He has what I see as like a noble amount of empathy. And he's wanting to join into society's efforts for survival, whereas Sasha wants to blame the victims of the Titan attack at Shiganshina. So maybe this internal conflict, as well as her conflict with her father, that might make it so that this cabin in the woods wasn't quite the home she wanted or ever thought it was. And we'll also see some struggles she's had as a cadet and in the military, and maybe this experience has tempered her attitudes towards the refugees, seeing firsthand the horrors that the Titans cause. But I think of some of the negative interactions shown, and those negative interactions may be there to tell us that the Scout Regiment is not her home either, like she still hasn't found a home yet. But we do see her being heroic and rescuing a child that society's left behind. She risks her own life in the process and pulls off a pretty gruesome eye stab on a titan. And I think she's fully expecting to die to save this child. And this shows like a reversal in her attitude of victim blaming from her flashbacks or her memories of the, the time that she spent with her father. And this is followed by what I perceive as a reconciliation with her father. Like he actually comes along on horseback helping people evacuate and I think at this moment when they're reunited, when Sasha is reunited with her father, who's now joined society in this collective survival effort, I think that is the moment when Sasha's finally home. And I think we have a few moments in Sasha's flashbacks that are worthy of some discussion. When she's fighting with her father over a chunk of like fat back or something she's trying to snack on, we learn why she's always hungry. The encroachment of civilization, and I'm going to say civilization with quote marks here, it's just more people moving into the area, but the encroachment on the wilderness has decreased the game available for hunting, and I'd also speculate that it's decreased sort of the wild edible vegetable uh, sort of thing and berries and those kind of things things that were available for forage also. And as a result, there's less of a stockpile of food and less food for daily use, and this causes her to feel hungry, right? But even with the decreased availability of those types of foods, Sasha doesn't appear to be malnourished when we see her, so I suspect there's like a strong emotional aspect to her compulsive eating. And I say that as a person who struggled with emotional eating over the years. But I'm going to say that eating probably gives her comfort, and it serves as like a psychological and an emotional link to her perceived ideas of the good old days. But given how young Sasha is, she probably overestimates how good the good old days were. 
And her father kind of touches on this idea. He tells her, he tells Sasha, if you plan to live by the old ways, you must also be prepared to die by the old ways. And this lets the viewer know that this wilderness life is not necessarily an easy one. He also tells her that if she turns her back on society now, when they need her, well, she can't ask society for help when she needs them. And when her father talks about dying the old ways... I start to wonder exactly what happened to Sasha's mother. And the predominant sort of wilderness trope would be that her mother died in childbirth, with with sort of an implication that perhaps if she'd been closer to a midwife or a doctor or a hospital or something, she might have survived the ordeal. But living this wilderness life and giving birth the old way led to her mother dying in childbirth the old way. That's what I speculate. And I can see an event like this one I've just imagined and speculated having a significant impact on Sasha's father's perspective. And this could be part of the reason he's so much more amenable to joining society than Sasha is. Because, you know, Sasha was a baby. She doesn't remember the whole ordeal. But we do know that Sasha joins the military. And I wonder, like, Sasha joining the military, does this represent a shift in her ideology? Like, has something changed between this flashback and when we see her eating that potato in front of the commandant? Or, you know, she's hungry. So did she just see joining the military as a way to get three squares and a cot? Like, perhaps with her father absent, she couldn't continue to survive by the old ways. And maybe game and forage grew even more scarce with time. Of course, another high likelihood possibility is that in this society, military service is compulsory. And I think that makes absolute sense given humanity's circumstance in this story. But I could also see how someone who's successfully living off the grid could probably circumvent this military requirement. Like, how would the government even know she existed to force her to join the military? There's also a flashback to Sasha's time as a cadet. And we see her joined by a familiar face here in Krista. But also, there's a new character who maligns Sasha for being overly polite. And I totally understand how not being familiar with social norms, Sasha may find comfort in hiding behind a mask of courtesy when she's interacting with other people. But I totally don't understand the aggressor's compulsion to complain about it. Because I say just live and let live, you know? But I admit my own bias in that I've at times been in interactions similar to Sasha's. And I can't understand why people can't just let me be the way I'm comfortable being. But more interesting to me in this interaction is the name of the instigator. Her name is Amir. Now, had I not seen Ilsa's notebook, I probably wouldn't have even remembered Amir's name. But that name is significant in the OVA. And I just have to believe it's significant here. But this character does seem too young to be the Amir who the OVA refers to. But there has to be a connection, right? And I don't think this is just a random coincidence. And in effect, the episode tells us as much at the beginning. Because there's this wagon heading out of Stohes. And Aaron, Armin, Levi, Mikasa, Hanji, and the Wallace Priest, well, they're all in it. And Hanji states that the priest belongs because he is random, just like the rest of them. But Levi replies that none of this is random. We're all here for a reason. So I'm extrapolating that same logic. You know, Levi knows that Ervin has all of them collected together for some reason. I'm extrapolating that same logic to say that the storytellers have named that cadet Emir for a reason. And for a reason that links to the events of Ilsa's notebook, or at least to the events that Ilsa's notebook is illuminating just a touch. Also in Stohess, the characters speak of a theory that Annie's stone skin technique and the substance used for her encapsulation are related to how the walls were constructed. This is a great concept, and it seems pretty darned obvious now. I'm not sure why I didn't think of it sooner. And I did note all the way back on episode one that the walls look like poured concrete, and that they didn't seem to match the construction technology used in the rest of the structures we see in this world. So the idea that Titans sacrifice themselves to protect humanity is a big deal. And it also feels like there might be a broken promise in there somewhere, probably a broken promise from the monarchy or from humanity, that might be the cause for the recent increase in hostilities. And I think that the Wallace's pose of devotion, you know, with the arms stretched out, well, I can see how this might be the posture the Titans held while forming these walls. And it all starts to make a little bit of sense now. And I guess we should check in with Connie before we're done. Connie makes it to what remains of his hometown. And it seems to have been destroyed entirely. There aren't any people there. 
And we get a clue of sorts in the form of a titan with withered limbs. He has like withered arms and legs. And he even has some exposed ribs in the center of a damaged building. He's just lying on top of this house that it looks like he's crushed. And it just happens to be Connie's former house. And the physical state of the titan with those withered limbs, well, they tell us that this creature probably couldn't have walked there. So it seems this titan must be a person who transformed and it didn't go well. It makes me think of a couple of Aaron's incomplete transformations. Like when he became a torso to protect Armin and Mikasa from the cannonballs. Or when he just partially transformed to grab a spoon. And this titan appears quite vulnerable, so I assume it'll be easy to like get the human out of the nape of the neck to extract that shifter and demand some answers. But of course, nothing in Attack on Titan ever goes as smoothly as we want it to, does it? And this titan, you know, it is in Connie's house. So is it a relative? Like, does Connie have a brother we haven't heard about and he's a Titan shifter? Or is it Armin's mom? Are we going to find out that maybe Connie is a shifter and doesn't even know it yet? I guess I'll just have to watch and find out. So I'm going to go watch a couple of more episodes and I'll talk to you soon. Sorry about the sunlight. I'm in the tropics.